afternoon and good evening. This is our sixth workshop of the year. We want to thank you all for joining us and let you know that we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to join us. I'm Tom Concolino, and I'm here with our presenters, Aya Takase and Angela Criswell. Thank you all for attending Rigaku's workshop series on X-ray computed tomography for materials and life science. This session is going to be on high resolution CT data collection techniques, and it will focus on the data collection methods for high resolution CT analysis. The session will be taking place in the lab with Aya and Angela reviewing in real time how to develop a scan for a variety of material science samples. All right, they'll also offer their thoughts on dealing with the unique challenges of performing CT experiments on those samples. Now, please note, if you missed any of the previous workshops, you can view them on the Rigaku website. But before we start, a few housekeeping items. As far as today goes, this is going to be an interactive session like our micro CT session from last month. Now, we'll still be taking your questions live during the webcast, but we'll be answering them during the session, so please don't wait until the end to ask. And as usual, please submit those questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We won't be monitoring the raised hand function, and I'll be posting relevant links in the chat window. Now, we'll be trying to answer as many questions as we can during the workshop, and we'll respond to any, un any unanswered questions after the session is complete. Now, if for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the workshop live, please note that it is being recorded, and you will be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. Okay, and with that said, I'll turn it over to Aya and Angela. Thanks, Tom and Angela, and thanks to everyone for joining us for the workshop. So today we are presenting live from our office in the Woodlands, Texas, and we will be demonstrating high resolution CT data collection techniques. So this is a part two of high resolution CT data collection. And we did a part one a couple months ago, and if you missed it, um, we have it recorded. I think Tom can put the link in the chat so that if you miss it, you can go back and watch part one. Okay. That is in the chat now. Thank you. So as far as part two goes, we will cover first um, keys for high resolution imaging. This is a little bit of a recap of what we talked about in the first part of this uh, high resolution data collection. And then we move on to sample movement, how to deal with it and how to prevent it. And also we will compare two different X-ray energy levels to see how they affect the CD uh, reconstructed images. So before I show you the instrument we're gonna use today, um, let me just show you the slide to explain the geometry we're using. So we are using parallel beam geometry, which is very suitable for high resolution uh, data collection. When I say high resolution, we're talking about uh, less than the micron um, resolution, sub-micron or one or two micron resolution uh, imaging. So you have the X-ray source on the left. Um, it is outside of this view in this slide, but and you take a relatively small X-ray beam and it goes to the sample, which sits in front of the scintillator, which converts the X-ray beam into visible light so that we're gonna use just regular optical lens to magnify the image before it hits the detector. So this is how a parallel beam geometry is constructed. Now on the X-ray source side, the particular system we're using today is called the Nano 3DX. And the Nano 3DX uses a rotating anode X-ray generator. This is a high power microfocus X-ray generator. And inside of the X-ray generator, we have this copper target. I will show you the uh, actual one in a second. And if you have the electron beam hitting this copper cup, you will have copper characteristic radiation, which is about 8 keV, and it is pseudo-monochromatic, and that goes to the sample. If you want to change the X-ray energy, let's say to 17 keV, which is a characteristic radiation from molybdenum, then Electron beam stays here, but you shift this uh, anode a little bit so that the electron beam hits molybdenum. And this switch can be done just by clicking a button on the computer screen. Now I'm gonna switch the view to the camera and show you the instrument. Do you see the camera view? We do. Yes. Okay. So let me step back a little bit. 
This is the Nano 3DX on X-ray CT scanner or X-ray microscope we're using today. And let me get closer so I can open the door. And a couple of the important components are hidden behind the panels or walls, but behind this panel, we have the X-ray generator. And this is where the X-ray filter can go in. And this is the sample stage and it's very bright, but this part has a scintillator in the lens. And behind this panel, we have a detector and we're using SCMOS. Uh, CCD can be used for high resolution data collection as well. Now I'm gonna put the camera down and show you the uh, anode. So we use this rotating anode X-ray generator so that we can put high power on, which is 1200 watts without melting the anode so that you can get a lot of X-ray photons. And the anode itself looks like this. It's quite heavy, but so this is the copper target or the cup. And this cup is rotating at 6,000 RPM so that when the electron hits this um, target at a high power, it's not gonna melt the copper. And it's being cooled uh, by water from the behind of the uh, anode. And it, this kind of belt looking thing that you see the different color from the copper. And on this anode, uh, that is tungsten. It could be chromium or it could be molybdenum, something other than copper. And this entire anode goes in and out so that you can have the electron beam hitting different locations. But this is on um, how the rotating anode generator kind of works and how you can switch between two anodes. And if you wanna use um, more than two anode materials, then this anode cup is exchangeable. So you can take the entire thing out as I was showing you and put another combination of two different anodes in to use different radiations. So that's the machine we're gonna use. And in part one, we had molybdenum 17 keV uh, target or radiation. So today, just for change, we're gonna use copper anode. So we have eight keV X-ray energy. And as far as the lens goes, we have a 20 X lens. So the voxel size, if you don't do any bidding on it, it's about quarter of micron voxel size or voxel resolution. So keep that in mind when we ask you to ch um, choose the measurement conditions we should be using. Okay, with that said, let's look at the first sample. And I'm gonna <clears throat> let Angela introduce the sample and ask the audience on what kind of scanning conditions we should be using. This is kind of recap of what we learned in part one. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna launch a poll. And while Aya gets a magnifying camera ready, and what we want you to do is to pick the set of scan conditions that'll provide the best balance of resolution and signal to noise in a two minute scan. Now this is a cram very small cranberry seed. It's sitting on a post of about a millimeter uh, diameter. Your choices for this data collection are binning two by two, 800 projections, binning three by three, 400 projections, or binning eight by eight, 200 projections. So we'll give everybody a chance to vote. We have a lot of them are coming in now. We'll see what we get. Kind of All even, right. isn't it? A horse race. It is, it is. <laughs> it's very even. So, but what I want to do now is I want to end this poll. I want to share Let's those results with you. And it's a tie between binning two by two and three by three. Okay. Uh, Tom, it's your choice. <laughs> oh, okay. How about we do uh, three by three with 400 projections? Three by three, 400. Okay. All right. So let me put this on the machine. Take this one out. 
and you probably can't really see much, but this is a sample. And now it's on the stage. So I'm gonna switch the screen so that you can see the uh, data collection software. Okay. So now you see the cranberry seed at the top. This is just a regular CCD camera view. And I'm gonna start the live image so that you get the X-ray view as well. Okay, we're looking at very much at the bottom. So let's take a look at this top part, the little tip of the seed. We're gonna try to do the scan in two minutes. So we're gonna just see um, top part of the seed. But if you spend longer time, you can scan the entire seed. So I'm gonna rotate this to 90 degrees to make sure it's not gonna go out of the view. Well, and it does a little bit. So what I'm doing now is to click the spot I want to bring to the center of the view. And this red little square is the field of view, which is about a 0.7 millimeter on a width the 20 excellence we're using today. And I can do the centering either in the X-ray view or the CCD view. Okay, I think that that should do. We should be able to see some details in this. I'm going back to zero. Okay, and stop this. And let's do a scan. And you guys will want it. Actually, it was a split, but Tom chose three. So I'm gonna do three by three and 400 projections in two minutes. And let me just give a name. and run the scan. So this will take two minutes plus alpha to save the data. Um, it's All probably right. a good time to answer some questions if there is any. Yeah, so we did get a question and you kind of addressed it at the beginning. So mm -hmm. um, Michelle asked, uh, can you collect multiple scans of different sections of this cranberry and then merge them to create the a single scan of the, the entire object? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Um, so in this particular setting, if you're gonna do that, uh, there are sections of the seed that's wider than the field of view. Uh, when you do stitching, you wanna do the stitching um, kind of in a vertical way. For the width, you can do what we call offset scan, meaning that there is a way to maximize the detector on size, meaning that you look at half of the sample first then when the sample rotates in the other way, you look at the other half of the sample. By doing so, this is a complicated one to kind of explain by talking about it, but <laughs> you can double the detector size effectively to cover the entire width of the seed. Then with that offset scan, you do probably top, middle, and bottom, or top and bottom halves, and combine or uh, merge the resulting scans afterwards to have the entire seed scan. All right, so hey, I, I'm looking at the screen here and the time hasn't changed. Is there uh, something not running? It is a running, it's uh, not updating the screen. <laughs> oh, that's on, okay, okay. Just wanted to make sure that I uh -huh. didn't from seeing that there was something not happening. Um, okay, so um, building on building on that, um, and you, I think you chat about this or we'll talk uh -huh. about this a little bit later on is um, the idea of um, feature size versus uh, field of view, and do we need, you know, those types of how do you, how do you maximize your, you know, collect best scan mm -hmm. for the mar largest things? Um, so we can talk a little bit about that as we go. So along. that essentially uh, comes down to let me make sure one thing. Okay, so it is a scanning. It's probably taking time to save the results because the scan is almost done. Okay, good, good. Uh, there you go. Now he went to yep. 399. But anyway, uh, <laughs> while it's saving the file. So it essentially comes down to the voxel resolution that you need to see whatever feature or details you're trying to image. So 
if you need, for example, a quarter micron voxel resolution, you have to stick with a 20x lens because even a binning one, that's the voxel resolution they have, a quarter micron. But if you need only, let's say, half a micron resolution, then you can change the lens to 10x and do binning one scan, which will give you about half a micron voxel size. But you're doubling the field of view by changing the lens. So if you can afford to use a little bit larger voxel resolution, you can change the lens to cover a larger field of view in one shot. I hope that answers the question. Um, we will have more time to address questions when we do more scans. Well, let's take a look at the cranberry scan that we just did. So we're gonna open the file. So we have a 400 projections. It was a quick scan, so it's a little bit noisy, but we do see some details. And usually uh, you would do center correction at this point, but I got everything aligned so that we can use zero as the center value. So I'm gonna just go ahead and reconstruct it. This will take probably a minute or so. So um, Aya, can you, uh, Mao's asked, uh, I hope mm -hmm. I'm pronouncing that correct. Mao's asked, uh, can you just review the settings for that scan again? That was a copper source with- It's uh, a copper source. Uh, that means you have a mostly 8 kV X-ray energy and we have 20 X lens and we're using binning three by three. So that means your voxel size is 0 0.965. That's your voxel resolution. And we collected 400 projections in two minutes. Am I missing anything else? Um, no, I think that those <laughs> okay. were the keys, right? No filters. So those no are the like, uh, main parameters anyway. Yeah, yeah. characteristic copper radiation. So if I, I missed think, uh, anything you, know, you wanted to know specifically, um, put it in Q&A and I can address that. So this is the tip of the seed. You can actually see quite a bit of uh, like a wrinkled surface details. And you also see uh, the center part of the seed and the skin and in between you have this kind of intricate structure which you can see pretty well in this scan. Now we did this with the binning three by three, 400 projections. Now let's, set, let's take a look at the other two scans collected under different conditions to see what kind of difference we'll see. So we're gonna switch to all point screen again. Okay. So if you use binning two by two, your voxel resolution is 0.64 microns. So that's a higher resolution, but this looks a little bit noisier than the one we just did because to collect the 800 projections in two minutes, you're reducing the exposure time per projection. So that makes the image a little bit noisy. If you do three by three, 400 projections, the voxel size becomes a little bit larger, 0.96 microns, and the image becomes a little bit less noisy. But you can still see the details. If you go all the way to eight by eight, the noise level goes down quite a bit, but the voxel size now is 2.56 microns. And that is not enough to see all those details um, between the core of the seed and the skin. Let's take a look at them all together. So you can see that uh, when the binning number is low or the higher resolution conditions with higher number of projections, you get more noise, but the resolution is higher. In the middle, three by three, uh, binning 400 projection scan, this probably is the best balance if you had only two minutes to do the scan because those details are still there. You can see them and it doesn't look too different here. It's only just noisy with the two by two scan. By eight by eight binning 200 projection scan, the resolution is too low in this case. The takeaway here um, as a recap is that, think about the resolution you're gonna need to see what you're trying to see and think about how much time you can spend on the scan. 
then based on those two numbers, you want to balance which kind of lens to use on or what kind of bidding conditions to use or how many projections to collect. Okay. So now with that reviewed, let's move on to the next sample. And I'm going to let Angela introduce the next sample and I show you the samples, but the Next question she's going to ask you is about the sample size and the field of view size, how to adjust those two. Okay. All right, so uh, we're going to be looking at a foam sample next, and Aya has pre-prepared uh, three different samples, and you're going to select which one we're going to collect data for. So I'm launching the poll now. You should see the question. So which of these is... Uh, is best for a 0.66 millimeter field of view measurement. So here is just the tip of the foam, piece of foam. So it's quite small in this case. Uh, the second option is that you choose to mount a piece of foam that's bigger than the field of view, or you have a third option that you mount a foam sample that's actually bigger and a bit longer than the field of view. So if you were mounting each of these or choosing one of these to collect data for, which of them would you choose uh, in this case? So again, it's gonna be another two minute experiment like we did before. And I'm gonna give you just a few more seconds. It's kind of hard to keep them still in the interview. Yes. <laughs> I was just gonna exactly. say that's the camera wobbling because the air conditioning is so good in the building. So it's yeah, like so. hand, hands, so. hands <laughs> All right. Let's see, which one is the cool. winner? Let's look at it. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results with everybody. And the answer is bigger and longer than the field of view. So the third okay. sample, Aya. I'm going to put the bigger and longer one then. Let me switch the camera. Okay. If you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm trying to get to the data collection software to unlock the door. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have too many finish. windows open. So let me get the seed out. Okay. In one sec, I need a base for this. I have to say, cranberry seeds are some of the most beautiful seeds that we've imaged here. Mm -hmm. Some of them are pretty. Um, Know, low in in features, but the cranberry is pretty nice. I didn't know that those seas are kind of bright red until mm. I got this like a nicely dried seas to scan. Okay, so you're seeing the data collection view yet? Not yet, right? Not nope. yet. Not yet. Nope. Camera view. There you go. Okay. Now so at the top, checking. you see the part of the Home. By the way, this is um, taken from an earplug. And this is the one, if you saw uh, Tom's LinkedIn post, that scan came from this sample. Okay. So in this case, the sample is pretty big compared to the field of view. So I don't need to be too picky about the alignment, but let's make sure it's roughly at the center. Maybe a little bit to the left. Okay, going back to zero. And then we'll be doing two minute scan for the rest of the workshop. And from the first exercise, we kind of figure it out that with this lens and two minute scan time, Binning three by three and 400 projections you know, seem to be a good combination. So we're going to stick with it. And let me put a name for this file and start a scan. All right, Aya. So we did have a couple of questions that came in actually based on the last scan. Mm -hmm. um, here to be a couple of uh, couple of users that know uh, know their CT. So Don <laughs> asked, uh, um, 
when doing the offset scan, he suggested uh, maybe 1.3 to 1.5 X on the offset. And then uh, stitching can be done with, uh, I'm guessing, VG Studio, um, mm -hmm. if, uh, if still not completely in the field of view. So Don wanted to offer some, uh, some thoughts on, on uh, I'm guessing, Good his tip. experience with, the, yeah. uh, with that. And then um, the, the second question we got here is from uh, from Keith, and he said, um, "Is there a uh, dithering function within the software for these the rings that I'm not sure everybody noticed, but I noticed yesterday, and I asked you mm -hmm. about that to get rid of this uh, these rings that you see around the center." The ring artifacts are one of the, um, uh, in my opinion, the most annoying <laughs> artifacts, and. Um, when the noise level is high, you tend to see more ring artifacts because they're essentially coming from um, any non-uniformity of the detector, um, I guess, sensitivity. If you have like a bad pixel, that's going to show up as a really clear ring in the view. And just tiny bit of a difference of sensitivity, depending on the energy vectors you're looking at, you might see intensity change and they all show up as rings. Noise does the same thing. Now, um, quick and dirty way to get rid of it is to apply noise reduction in a form of smoothing, either to the raw projections or the resulting image. Um, that's the probably the dirtiest but quickest way to do it. The other end of the spectrum, as far as how to correct the ring uh, artifacts goes, is to actually shift the detector between projections. You take one projection and a sample rotates, and you shift the detector a little bit and take next projection, shift it back, and you just keep doing it so that you are not using the same pixel to look at the same location. And that way you can average out the non-uniformity you have, non-uniformity you can't quite correct perfectly on yes. the detector and that gets um this detector movement gets rid of it and it's our and angela's and mine our experience that that works very well it takes longer because you have to do this you know in between projections but on um, it does a really good job to get rid of ring artifacts interesting thank you <laughs> good question keith thank you yeah, that's a good question. I, I think um, if you've done any CT scan, you know what ring artifacts are. And my guess is that you don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at the scan. Did I open it? Oh, there it is. Okay. So we have 400 projections. It, you know, at a glance, it looks fine. So let's go ahead and do the reconstruction. So the kind of point of this exercise is that when you have a sample that's foam or porous material, maybe, you know, maybe some composite material, which you're going to section anyway to a certain size to do a high resolution scan. Now you have a choice of how big or how small of a sample you're gonna use. And this uh, question or exercise will give you some pointers in terms of what you should be doing. Okay, so this is the reconstructed foam in 3D and looks reasonable. And those images are a little dark, so let me adjust the window level, okay. So this looks decent to me. Again, it's a little bit noisy, but it's a two minute scan with about a micron resolution. So it's not too bad. But when you scan through this, it's kind of subtle. I don't know if you can see it. You see that there are some streaks going sideways. They really shouldn't be there, but they are. And this is happening because that sample it's a soft sample, right? And we made it really long. So it was probably moving like this tiny bit during the scan. So that's one of the things you have to be careful about the sample movement. So let's take a look at the other two scans as well and see what kind of a difference we see in them. So I'm gonna switch back. 
Okay. So the first one, if you choose the tiny, tiny sample that has a little tip that more or less matches the size of field of view, this is a scan that you're gonna get. The image quality wise, this is pretty good for two minute scan. You can clearly see the foam and the air. They have a very you know, good contrast, but you might realize that those pores in the foam are not round shaped. They are kind of broken. This one looks even worse. When you have a fragile sample like a foam or porous material, and if you cut it down to the size of field of view, you will be seeing the damaged surface. So in this case, you want the sample to be a little bit bigger than the field of view so that you will scan the intact center part. Now, if you make the sample a little bit bigger, you get a scan like this. This is a bigger than field of view, but not long, kind of chubby sample. This one looks pretty good. I don't see any streaks running and you don't see any damage from the sample sectioning. So this looks pretty good. And if you do a long one, like the one we just did, you might or you might not uh, but see those streaks coming from the sample movement. So let's compare all three, okay. The first two in a tiny sample and a little bit bigger but not long sample, they look okay, um, except that the small sample is showing some damages. Now, I don't know if you can see this, it's a really, really subtle difference. But this tip or a small sample scan has a little bit lower noise level than this big sample. If you compare their histograms, you can see the difference a little bit uh, better. So with the tip, when the sample size was more or less matching the field of view, you see sharp peak, this is a histogram. You see a sharp peak from air and another little peak from the foam and you have a dip in between, meaning that they have pretty good contrast and easy to segment. When you look at this larger sample scan, the air peak is broader and the same thing for the polymer. You don't see a clear dip or a separation between the two. So this means that on, it might be challenging to segment this image using at least traditional thresholding. This happens because when you have a bigger sample than the field of view, even if you don't care about this outside of the field of view part, that those areas are still absorbing X-rays, reducing X-ray intensity, also changing X-ray intensities. And that's why when you have a whole lot of volume outside of field of view, you tend to see higher level of noise. So you wanna make your sample a little bit bigger than the field of view, but not like a five, 10 times bigger than the field of view. You want that to be just right. Now let's take a look at the long sample a little bit more. If you do a two minute scan on that long kind of wobbly sample, it doesn't look too bad because it's not gonna move that much in two minutes. But if you use the same sample and run the scanner for 60 minutes, this is what you're gonna get. Now you can kind of see that the, everything is swinging, right? And everything is blurred. So now the question is, how can you tell that the sample was moving? And how can I tell that this is not the way the sample is, but this is just the sample moving around? So that's gonna be the next question for you, the audience. All right, so let's launch that uh, poll one more time, addressing the question that I just talked about. So how do you tell that the sample's moving? Um, how would you do that? Would it uh, come across that it, the contrast is very low or would it manifest as a problem where you cannot find a center correction value or instead, can you not tell it all from the CT data? So we'll just give a, a few seconds to give everybody a chance to vote. All right, I see quite a few coming in and this one looks like it definitely has a clear leader okay. in the sense <laughs> that everybody uh, believes you can tell, so nobody said you can't tell, but, and they feel like it manifests as a uh, problem finding the center correction value. Okay. Well, I can see that the people were paying attention or you just know what you're talking about. That is the correct answer. You must have watched your first session. Yeah, we, we did talk about this in the first, uh, the part one session. 
So let me switch the screen and show you the center correction. Okay, so this is the 60 minute scan. You have 800 projections. And when you just look at the projections, you can't necessarily tell that the sample is moving around. But if you look at the focus correction, so you see the focus value at the top, zero is the value closest to the mechanical alignment. So when you're at a minus 15, that's a force out of focus. But when I change this and I get closer to zero, I really have, you know, I don't see any sign of image focusing. And at the center zero, it doesn't focus and you can pass it and go all the way to plus 15 but it doesn't focus at all. And this is a really typical sign that the sample wasn't moving during the scan. You might see the sample movement effect as you're seeing here as kind of streaking lines, either horizontal you know, lines or vertical lines on if you do zero to 180 degree scan. If you do zero to 360 degrees scan, you probably don't see those streaks in one direction, but you will see on, if you scan, let's say a cylinder, you will see the cylinder cross section and you see another one bigger. When you have like that double damage, that's another sign that your sample was moving. So you can tell, and you probably wanna be looking for the sign of sample movement. If you know that the sample is not too rigid and it might've moved during the scan. Now, I'm going to show you something else. Okay, we don't need this guy anymore. So let's say that you're planning to do 10, 20 hour scan. You don't want to go ahead and spend 20 hours and hope for the best and come in next morning and realize your sample was moving. That's probably not a good strategy. So if you're planning to do a long scan, um, I would recommend you take a look at the projection like this one. This is just a 2D projection, not 3D CT. And collect the projection every minute or so for 45 or 60 minutes to see if the sample is moving or to see how long it takes for the sample to settle and stop moving. So this is a 2D projection from the phone we just scanned. And at the top, you see 45, 45. So this is after 45 minutes. Now let's rewind this all the way to the first minute. So this is the first minute mark projection. You can see when you go through from one to 45, you can see that this foam is springing back. It's still moving for the first almost 30 minutes, the 22, and this is 30 minute. And after 30 minute mark, the movement is very small. And you can, from those projections after 45 minutes, you can comfortably say that, okay, the sample gets settled and it stops moving after 45 minutes. Now you know to wait for 45 minutes before you start a 20 hour scan. If the sample moved in the first 45 minutes of a 20 hour scan, that's going, there's a good chance that that first 45 minutes sample movement is gonna ruin your 20 hour scan. So this is something good to check before you commit to a long scan. Okay, so let's, that was about the sample movement and let's move on to the next sample. By the way, I'm using double-sided tape to hold this foam sample and um, let me switch the screen first. If you are curious about what other materials you can use um, to hold those small samples for high resolution scan, um, that's another topic we covered in part one. Okay, so this is the next sample. All right, so we're gonna be looking at a polymer layered sample. So I'm gonna launch the poll here and while I, uh, gets the sample ready and shows it to you. So this uh, sample is a layer of parafilm and UV resin. And I want you to select the X-ray energy that differentiates the parafilm and UV resin best. So would you say that's uh, copper radiation or moly? 
So copper is 8 keV, moly again, 17 keV. And you can sort of see the layers here in the sample uh, view image that I is showing to us. So we'll give it a couple more seconds for additional votes to come in. And this one is by far um, the biggest landslide we've seen so far. So I'm gonna end the poll, share the results with all of you. So copper won in this case uh, as the ideal X-ray energy to differentiate the parafilm and the UV resin. Okay. Um, we have the copper source, so that's convenient. Gonna... Oh, did I just hide the camera? Okay. Mm -hmm. There it is. There it is. So let me take this earplug out. And I'm gonna put the polymer sheets. I guess you can't really see this, but yeah, it's a little out of focus. Yeah. And a little small. Mm. Yeah, well, you saw it under the microscope. You will see it again uh, from the CCD view. Okay. Now let me switch this. Okay. Do you see a better view at the top now? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So let me open the shutter and let's get the X-ray view as well, which probably doesn't show much in this case. Okay. So you see a little bit darker part in the middle, and that's most likely coming from UV resin. So I'm gonna center. A sample using that and let's do 90 degrees okay that's way off okay that's pretty much centered so I'll go back to zero Okay, so this looks good. So let's do a scan. If you're wondering what this kind of fibery thing you see here, that's the, um, the wax paper that is on parafilm. And if you can picture it, parafilm usually comes in a roll or sheets, but they have wax paper like thing in between so that they don't stick to each other. All right. So while that's scanning, I we did have a couple more questions come in. Um, one of them actually goes back to the cranberry, um, mm -hmm. where we were talking about the uh, Spinning size and uh, lenses and so on is. Is there any benefit to reducing the bidding size and changing the lens when the um, feature size is not affected by that? Essentially, what your full voxel size is, right? So if you have a if you're bidding a four by four or three by three, that gives you about a one micron voxel. So we're for, talking about reducing the bidding size, right? Yeah, reducing the bidding and changing the lens. So if you reduce the binning size, your resolution goes up. I'm trying to figure out the scenario where you reduce the binning size. Well, say you went from a four by four to a two by two, mm -hmm. right? But you went from a 20X lens to a 10X lens, right? So those are the okay, same. Okay, so you go from four by four to two by two. Now yep. your voxel size is a half. Yep and you change the lens from so 20 that you, to 10 right mm -hmm. those would be the same voxel size now for the two by two Where the one by one bidding now for four by four versus two by two right but the, change the lens. what what two by two binning means in voxel size changes when you change the lens Right. And if you, oh, yeah. oh, okay, I see. So if you go from four by four to two by two, and if you change the lens, you can go back to four by four without changing the voxel size. I guess right. that's the scenario. Okay. Right, right. 
And so is there any benefit to modify making in, those in that case right? the benefit is that you can reduce the scan time because four by four means that you're combining more pixels together that usually means a higher x-ray count mm. and a higher x-ray count means that you can shorten the exposure time or scan time what you're losing there is the field of view when you change the lens to do that on uh, your field of view becomes smaller. But if your sample is tiny, and by changing the lens, you still cover the entire sample and go from uh, two by two to four by four, as a result of changing the lens, yeah. you, um, you can do a scan faster. So the speed is the benefit. Okay. Like it's like we have too many parameters to think about, right? too many choices. <laughs> We'll look at this one. So again, we have, we did a three by three binning and it got 400 projections. And when you look at the sample from a certain direction and from the side, the bit on, you see the center part is darker, that's UV resin and you have parafilm on this side, you have paper and you have another polymer sheet on this side. And you can clearly see that the UV resin is higher density, but you're assuming, when I say that, we're assuming that the thickness of the sample is the same because in projections, even if the sample density is the same, if one part is thicker, that part is gonna absorb more X-rays. So to really see the density difference, we do have to reconstruct the results. So let me run that. When Angela was doing the similar comparison for um, glue or sample holding materials, she prepared all materials at the same thickness so that we can do the comparison in 2D. But if the thickness is not a uniform, you can't really judge which one has lower or higher density just from 2D projection. Okay. So let me see. I think the top right Cross section is the easiest one to see. This is another part that's potentially confusing, but in projections, usually dark color means higher density. Once you do the reconstruction, the lighter color usually means higher density. So again, you see the center part, UV resin uh, having a higher density than the parafilm or this polymer sheet. So this is a scan by copper 8 kV radiation. And by the way, that is the right choice. But let's see what happens if you did the same scan with molybdenum radiation. So let me switch back. Okay. So this is the comparison. The scan you have on the left, this is the one we just did, copper radiation, two minute scan. The one on the right is the molybdenum scan but we spent 20 minutes just to see some difference. And even after 20 minutes, you can barely see that the center UV resin part is higher density than the other two sheets. So you can, you know, right off the bat, see that the molybdenum is probably not a good choice for this sample. Now, just to do apple to apple comparison, I did a 20 minute copper scan as well. And this is the result. If you spend 20 minutes with the copper, um, you can clearly see that this is UV resin and you have two different polymer layers and paper. And if you look at this profile, you can see the change in gray level. Those two are two different levels. With the molybdenum, when you look at the image, you can kind of tell that the center part is lighter uh, colored, but when you look at the profile, it's really hard to tell the difference or identify the borderline. Now, to give you an idea of what kind of density difference we're talking about here, UV resonance density is 1.12 grams per cubic centimeters. And this layer uh, is 0 0.92 grams per cubic centimeters polymer. Parafilm, they do not disclose the uh, recipe for parafilm. So 
I can only speculate, but it should be anywhere from 0 0.9 to 0 0.95 in density. So if those two layers might have exactly the same density, then it makes sense that they look the same. But you can clearly tell the difference between 0 0.92 and 1.12 with the copper radiation. Um, we have seen about an 8% density difference with copper. And um, if you need a more a higher sensitivity, then with the chromium, we have seen about 5% density difference. And all of them are for low density organic materials. When you wanna see tiny difference between the higher density materials like carbon or maybe silicon dioxide, then you wanna change the radiation to match it, which now relates to the next question. So let's move on to the last sample. All right, so this is a glass fiber sample and I is gonna show us what that sample looks like. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna launch a poll related to the sample, again, asking which energy should we use? And in this case, we're have, we have glass fibers. So please select the vote for the energy that we use in this case. Give everybody a couple of seconds. I guess you don't see much in the sample, but the, this is like a bundle of glass fibers. Mm. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up the poll and share the results with everyone. And the audience has selected Molly radiation as more ideal to generate better image quality for the glass fiber. This probably was an easy one, right? You just gave them the answer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I spoke a little too early, but you could tell that the couple was better for polymer. So I thought that you would get this one right. Now, for glass fiber scans, it takes about two hours at least to see the fibers very well. So I'm not going to make you sit and wait for two hours and show you the results. Okay, so those are the CT scans from copper and molybdenum for glass fibers you just saw. When you use copper radiation, this was a binning two by two um, 0.64 microns voxel size scan. It took two hours. You get great contrast. Uh, the glass fibers look very, very bright and everything else is very, very dark, which is kind of nice, but you see those streaks coming kind of around or from the glass fibers. And those are beam hardening artifacts. And you don't see that when you use molybdenum 17 keV. This is a scanner we saw in part one when we're using molybdenum. You have a good contrast between the, uh, the resin and the glass fibers and the air, and you don't see any sign of um, beam hardening artifacts. So you got this one right, molybdenum works better for glass fibers because they are more absorbing. The density is about 2.4 grams per cubic centimeters. Now, you might be wondering, you know, if you're using at least almost on uh, monochromatic radiation, why would you get beam hardening artifacts? They, you know, they happen only when you use continuous radiation. Well, this is the key is it's almost monochromatic. So when you use a copper characteristic radiation, the majority of the radiation that you're using is a KV copper characteristic radiation, but there is a background, which is the bram strolling radiation that has a wider range and usually higher energy than copper characteristic radiation. So when the copper AKV x-rays cannot get through the glass fibers, that higher energy bram strolling background radiation becomes the main x-rays you're gonna count. And that's where the beam hardening comes from. So the takeaway is, Although this is not an easy question to answer always, but on um, think about what X-ray energy would fit the best for your sample and density difference you're trying to see. And if you ever see beam hardening artifacts when you're using characteristic radiation, that means that you have to go higher than the one you're using right now. Okay, so this was the last scan I wanted to show you. So we're gonna 
wrap this up a little bit, then for the rest of the time we have, we can answer more questions. Okay. So we just covered some keys for high resolution imaging. And if you wanna learn more about that particular uh, topic, we would recommend um, part one of this series. And we also talked about sample movement, how you can tell if it's moving and how to prevent it. And we compare the copper and the molybdenum radiations to see what kind of differences we see in X-ray CT scans. Okay, I think, yeah, we still have a few more minutes. Yeah, so, um, sorry, uh, we do have time for a quick Q and A. Um, we didn't get anything in, on board, but um, there was a question, Aya, is, um, you know, is there a benefit to using characteristic x-rays, right, to using the characteristic mm -hmm. radiation versus the um, um, you know, white radiation, essentially? Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk about that a little bit, just in the last minute or so that we sure. have here? So assuming that you have um, optimum energy level characteristic radiation. It's always better to use characteristic radiation because when you have only characteristic radiation, meaning monochromatic radiation, because if you use a monochromatic radiation, you are not gonna get any beam hardening artifacts. You have only one energy. It's not gonna get hotter or softer or anything during the scan. So you can avoid uh, beam hardening artifacts. The other kind of subtle benefit is that when you do reconstruction, most of the reconstruction algorithms are assuming monochromatic radiation. And that's kind of why you get beam hardening artifacts when the actual X-rays are not monochromatic. But your experiment is closer to the algorithm you're using for reconstruction, meaning that your results would be more accurate and you tend to have a better sensitivity to slight density difference. On another benefit of using characteristic radiation, this is about the uh, machine, not necessarily the X-ray physics for CT, but when you look at the spectrum of X-rays coming from any target material, the white radiation or Ramsey-Rowling radiation is like this. It's really, really broad. Characteristic radiation is a very narrow peak with orders of magnitude higher X-ray intensity. So it's a more efficient, higher intensity uh, source to use. So that's another, on the generator side, a benefit. Okay, all right. So um, that actually, that's all the time that we have for, uh, for these questions. Um, we do have some questions saved and we'll get back to you directly uh, after the session. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a recording of the workshop will be available tomorrow and an email will go out to all the registrants with instructions on how to view the recorded presentation. Also in the chat, I've just posted a link to the quick reference guide in case you didn't download that before the session, as well as uh, the link to the registration for our next session. Um, these links will be in the, uh, on the myth landing page, as well as the email that goes out to you. All right, so we'll be hosting another interactive workshop focusing on advanced analysis techniques in Dragonfly on Wednesday, September the 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. We look forward to seeing all of you then. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you in September. Bye-bye now.